हेलो एवरी वन सो टूडे आई बी डिस्कसिंग कार्डियोलॉजी क्वेश्चन क्वेश्चन नंबर वन वी हैव ए सिक्सटी टू ईयर ओल्ड जेंटलमैन एंड बी पी इज पुअरली कंट्रोल स्टिल वेरी हाई वन फिफ्टी टू बाई नाइनटी एंड ऑलरेडी टेकिंग रेमीप्रिल एंड बेंड्रो फ्लू मिथियाजाइट एंड एम लोड पीन ही इज टेकिंग वन ए सी ई आई वन थाइजाइड एंड वन कैल्शियम चैनल ब्लॉकर थ्री डग्स कंट्रोल एज सिक्सटी टू ईयर स्टिल बी पी नॉट कंट्रोल ओके एंड इन एडिशन टू दैट एसप्रीन एंड सिम्बा स्टेटिन आर देयर एंड द लैब पैरामीटर्स आर गिवन टू यू नाउ वॉट इज द मोस्ट अप्रोप्रिएट चेन दैट वी शुड डू इन हिस्स मेडिकेशन द आंसर दिस क्वेश्चन इज एड spirono lactone now why this the answer why not others let's learn the basic so in this case poorly control hypertension is there yes why we say poorly control already taking three ducts but still not control okay as it right already taking acei calcium channel blocker and thyroid diuretic right so But one thing is potassium is less than five, four point five millimole per liter. This is very very important. So as the potassium is less than four point five, so we should add spironolactone. Now we all know very well it is a potassium sparing diuretics. Okay, so. Uh, okay. As the potassium is less than 4.5, so we can add. Suppose the potassium level was high, then definitely we would not have used spironolactone. Then we would have done something else. What is done? How done? This all I'll be discussing in the coming slides. Okay. So, as of now, this patient is has reached the step four in the nice hypertension guidelines. What are the nice guidelines? Again, I'll be discussing in the coming slide. But as of now, just note down. There's something called step four in the nice hypertension guidelines. So as I was talking to you, potassium is less, so we can add spironolactone. The key word to be remembered here is uh, potassium is less than four point five, and add spironolactone. Okay, with this background, we go to what are the nice guidelines in the management of hypertension. So the nice guideline they publish guidelines in nineteen two thousand nineteen last year only. So let us see what are the hallmark of this. First of all, what he says that first of all you should know what are the stages of hypertension: stage one, stage two, and severe hypertension. Right. But I like to inform you that as these guidelines given by the nice. they are different from what american cardiological association gives which is given in harrison also so as we are writing mrcp so we'll follow exactly what nice guidelines say but it's my duty to inform you that there is some difference in the american and the british approach so what is stage 1 hypertension the in the clinic bp is more than or equal to 140 by 90 okay and subsequent abpm that is abpm stand for ambulatory bp monitoring or hbpm home this is home bp monitoring and this is ambulatory bp monitoring if it is more than 135 to 85 we call as stage 1 hypertension point to be noted that in the clinic patient has come to you bp is more than 140 by 90 but he also says doctor i have a bp checking machine at home and i check bp it was 130 by 5 by 85 so what he say what nice nice guidelines say that some amount of increase bp does occur does occur when the patient reaches the hospital and this is so called white coat hypertension 
white coat white coat in fact the term called white coat hypertension patient has normal bp at home but when the patient reaches hospital the bp is very very high this is so called white coat hypertension so but leave, leave aside the white coat hypertension he says nice guideline he has given a margin of 5 mm hair both the ways but anyway in not shell or the carry home message for us bp more than 140 by 90 is stage 1 this is only keyword you got to remember stage 2 in the clinic bp is more than 160 by 100 at home more than 150 by 95 point to be noted in in case of stage 1 in case of stage 1 it was 135 and 140 85 and 90 home and clinic difference but in stage 2 it is 150 and 160 and 95 and 100 point to be noted very carefully so nice guidelines is giving importance to the home bp checking also and finally severe hypertension when systolic bp is more than 180 or diastolic bp more than 110 this is in the in the clinic both are in the clinic okay so in the clinic bp is more than 180 by 110 we call it to be severe hypertension so in the clinic stage 1 140 by 90 stage 2 160 100 and stage severe hypertension what it is 180 110 is severe hypertension now how to manage a case of hypertension nice guidelines nice guidelines very clearly says that lifestyle modification is mandatory to for a proper control of bp low salt diet is the first thing that you got to remember less than 6 g ideally less than 6 3 but in the exam they will talk about 6 g less than 6 g so the first thing is salt reduce salt intake and in average uk is about 8 to 12 let's presume 10 okay so he maybe 12 also so what they want the, the salt intake should be cut down to almost 50 percent okay now they also mention nice guideline that there was a paper in british medical journal they say that if the low salt intake the car it has a significant fall of bp may be as high as 10 mm of mercury fairly good so the carry home message at the moment is low salt diet is the only only uh, uh thing that you got important point that you got to know in this particular slide number 2 caffeine intake should be re reduced well coffee intake should be reduced and of course if there, if there is somebody who is hypertensive and you ask him to take less coffee and he loves coffee oh i don't think he will like it but at least for exam point of view you have to know that coffee intake has to be reduced in addition to that stop smoking drink less alcohol balanced diet fruits vegetable exercise this is well known to all of you anyways that lifestyle modification the single most important and uh, and mild hypertensive patient can be managed by simple diet a so called lifestyle modification so there were terms which will be coming again ab pm is 24 hour ambulatory bp monitoring and hb mp is home bp monitoring okay the terms they will be coming again and again right chali after that after that home home bp is more than 135 or 85 and we learned that in the clinic in the clinic it is 140 by 90 this is stage 1 which i already told you as per nice guidelines what to do with this patient okay 
what nice guidelines say if the patient is below 80 year of age and any one of the following let us see what are the following point to be noted he is talking about the patient ages below 80 and anyone target organ damage maybe kidney damage or eye problem or coronary problem or established cardiovascular disease there is patient already has a coronary artery disease or congestive heart failure patient has a renal disease or diabetes they are the one which are considered as the end organ damage plus patient has diabetes so maybe eye problem maybe renal problem maybe coronary problem okay plus a patient has diabetes then they come in the stage one age below 80 plus any one of them so now what are the recommendation what are the recommendation that in such cases we should consider antihypertensive drug therapy okay in addition to lifestyle changes what drug is to be added this i'll be talking to you right now so first of all is stage one he described what is thus in what are the indication of using uh, treatment above 80 year what is to be done this he'll talk next now we have a patient whose bp home bp 150 95 okay so that he is in stage two so now in this patient you can treat whatever regardless of age in the step in the stage one he was treating below 80 years he did not talk about above 80 years that means he says above 80 years there is no problem leave it but now if the patient is stage two regardless of age you have to treat the patient and the patient is below 40 year if the young patient is there then what they also say that bp high young patient below 40 year in stage 2 you should always rule out secondary causes so keyword are treat the patient regardless of the age and below 40 year rule out secondary causes now now we see how to treat the patient okay how to treat the patient step one step two step wise approach as per nice guidelines this need a very careful understanding of subject so i'll go slowly and i'll repeat twice step one treatment when you are planning treatment of course uh, it may be stage, stage one or stage two patient age is below 55 years point to be noted or patient has type 2 diabetes below 55 year or type 1 or type 2 diabetes use acei or arp use ace inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker i hope you know the full form and this we will be writing as a a this is a okay well normally we always prefer to go by acei but one of the commonest problem with aci is cuff dry cuff is very irritating so if dry cuff is there then definitely don't use aci and use arb okay so arb we use angiotensin receptor blocking drug we use when the aci are contraindicated now patient is above above 55 years it was below 55 years okay or it was diabetic patient now other way around the patient age is above 55 year or or he has a he is a black african or african caribbean then the first line treatment is calcium channel blocker what we will write here as a c a was aci or arb calcium channel blocker is c 
पर नाउ वाई नॉट वाई नॉट वाई नॉट का इन का अफ्रीकन दिस ब्लैक पीपल वी शुड यूज ए सी आई बिकॉज बट दे से दैट इन ब्लैक अफ्रीकन और अफ्रीकन करेबियन ओरिजन दे हैव रिड्यूस एफिकेसी विद ए सी ई आई दे आर नॉट वेरी इफेक्टिव इन दो पेशेंट सो नाउ नॉट ओनली एज इज इन्वॉल्व इवन एथनिसिटी इज ऑल्सो गेटिंग इन्वॉल्व ब्लैक अफ्रीकन और अफ्रीकन करीबियन कंट्री पीपल दे मे बी इवन बिलो फिफ्टी फाइव ईयर रिमेंबर दे मे बी बिलो फिफ्टी फाइव ईयर दैन द फर्स्ट लाइन ट्रीटमेंट इज कैल्शियम चैनल ब्लॉकर वट वी राइट एज सी सो फ्रेंड्स बिलो फिफ्टी फाइव ए सी आई अब फिफ्टी फाइव ओके अब पेशेंट विद अब एनी एज अब एनी एथनिसिटी अब फिफ्टी फाइव और ब्लैक अफ्रीकन बिलो फिफ्टी फाइव ऑल्सो वी यूज कैल्शियम चैनल ब्लॉकर्स so we have given either a or c depending on depending on so so far in nutshell in stage stage one, step 1 a or c this is summary of step 1 treatment make a box of this line so step 1 either a or c is the treatment now we come to step 2 patient is taking a or c okay or c so what to do what to do if he is taking a then you add c point with this summary if he is taking a then you add c in this patient or the patient is taking a then even you can add diuretic also okay Diuretic also. Got it, right? So point to be noted: if he is taking A C I, you want to add second drug is C or A plus D. D is diuretic. But okay. Suppose he is taking C. He is taking C. Who? Maybe black African. Then you add A. things remain the same but it was a we added c you are now c we are adding a done but there is a again one more clue we have a black african or african caribbean he is taking calcium channel blocker and you want to add then you should add a r b a r b a r b is better for don't use a c i in african people they they say they have more of cuff so friends c plus a a is arp all right so what i told you so far simplest way in stage 1 in in step 1 treatment either a or c step 2 a plus c or c plus a if he is taking a add c he is taking c add a but if he is taking a you can even add d also so this is summary so this is the summary of the whole show this is step 2 and this was step 1 simplified version now step 3 he is taking two drugs and now you have to add third drug he is taking a and c add d so now it become a c d if he is taking a d then you make c ultimately this is step 3 very easy to so step 3 is a c d very simple okay step 4 step 4 nice define as resistant hypertension remember he is already taking three drug a c d and one is a diuretic also okay and still bp not getting control the patient need fourth drug so you have to add fourth drug okay and what nice guideline also suggests that if up to three they are not getting control 
you can seek a specialist advice also either you give a fourth drug or you take a specialist advice now anyway forget the specialist advice we are not taking specialist advice and you are treating yourself so now one more thing he told you what the definition of resistant hypertension lie down resistant of hypertension means he is taking three or more than three drugs but still bp not controlled then we call as resistant hypertension so if now three drug you look for the potassium low less than 4.5 add spironolactone but if the potassium is more than 4.5 you can add alpha or beta blocker so this is the stage 4 to so take a step 4 depend on potassium level now in our question in our question the potassium level is less than 4.5 to so we we added spironolactone but if the same question is asked to you maybe the potassium level is 5 then you can give either alpha or beta blocker okay right and one more thing guy nice guideline say the patient needs Because for drug, then you should always seek for a specialist advice. Now, what is our target? What nice guidelines say? You are treating the patient. We want below a tier. It should be ambulatory BP below one forty ninety, home BP one thirty five eighty five, above eighty years one fifty ninety and one forty five eighty five. these are the target that we want to achieve a for ambulatory bp bp monitoring and home bp monitoring this you should know so they are the target guidelines as per the nice new drug they talk about uh, nice has approved this drug is eliskiren is a renin inhibitor and it blocks conversion of angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1 So this drug also has been recommended, but it's a renin inhibitor. Okay, it's a renin inhibitor, Eliskar. So I hope you are clear about the guidelines given by the Nice how to treat a case of hypertension. So a quick recap, as per Nice guidelines, lifestyle modification. If not, go for the first step, either A or C. Step two, A plus C. or a plus d stage stage 3 a c d stage 4 a c d remember he is already taking thiazide diuretic so now we are adding spironolactone depending on potassium level if the potassium level is less than 4.5 spironolactone if more than 4.5 add alpha or beta blocker now we have 52 year old man he is taking remipril bp high next step so now concept should be very very clear right so he is 52 year that is below 55 years and remipril he is taking a so as per our learning just now either we can go for a plus c or a plus d simple so in this case either we can add amlodipine or indepamide which is nothing but a thiazide like diuretic amlodipine and no way we don't do together they come in the stage 3 add amlodipine or bisoprolol no bisoprolol is a beta blocker we use either calcium or diuretic Remipril or losartan, no. Okay, and so, uh, what he says that you stop remipril. No way. There is no side effect of remipril. We will switch to losartan only. Patient had a side effect, not indication. Add losartan. There is no point in adding ACI plus ARP. No. So this is the best answer. Okay. So by rule out technique. and but by knowing the basic concept you are clear the answer is d question 
Lovely question. Beta blocker are in treating hypertension has declined sharply over the last five years. What he says in the last five years, beta blocker used in the hypertension treatment has been drastically reduced. What is the reason behind that? Answer is A. Less likely to be prevent stroke and potential impairment of glucose tolerance. That means beta blockers are very good in preventing myocardial infarction. Very good for coronary artery problem. But they are not good in preventing the stroke. So they are less likely to do use. So let's learn the basic concept. There was a well-known trial, Escort BPLA trial. What is the full form is Anglo Scandinavian Cardiac Outcome Trial BP Lowering Arm. This trial was done and they controlled the BP but the result was that they were very good in preventing the coronary artery but beta blockers are not good in preventing the stroke. Moreover, we also know that when you are B using beta blocker, they mask the hypoglycemic symptom. Hypoglycemic symptom are masks so patient doesn't react to hypoglycemia because already the beta blocker has been used. So that's why this is not a drug that we are using so often in in uh, treating and preventing stroke okay let's look into other options also less likely to prevent myocardial infarction no they are very good drug in fact for coronary artery disease beta blocker should always be added to control heart rate always High rate of interaction with other commonly prescribed medication is not high rate. Some, some, but not very high rate. Not at all. Okay. Increase incidence of adverse effect. No, adverse effect are not. But as far as stroke is concerned, that is much more important. Increase incidence of chronic obstructive air diabetes. It lead to, but not. In fact, we don't, in a patient of COPD, we don't use beta blocker. But it itself is not a cause of beta blocker. Oh, beta blocker is not a cause of COPD. Uh, definitely, we all know that we don't give in uh, asthma or COPD. Okay, they are not the causing. So, best answer is E in this. Question four, we are getting a diabetic nephropathy, hypertension, and he is taking insulin, thiazid, uh, or remipril and amlodipine. He is taking A, C, and D. He is taking creatinine 215, 29, GFR 29, urea 12.8 12 millimole per liter. So, renal function was similar to three months ago. What is the most appropriate step now? The answer is switch thiazide to frosamide. Why it is the answer? Why not others? Let's go into the basic. Here, first of all, GFR is 29 ml per minute. Look into GFR once again. 29. Definitely is very low. Okay. Right. And Low GFR indicate, definitely I don't need to say that he has a chronic kidney disease. Moreover, in our patient also, urea and creatine both are very high. With low GFR, it is very clear the patient has a chronic kidney disease. How can you say? Why can't you be acute renal failure? What he said, that three months ago also, his lab report was same. That means he already had the disease for the last three months, he fits into the category of chronic renal failure. So, when the patient has chronic kidney disease, they usually have hypertension and they usually need two drugs 
to treat hypertension. Two or more than two drugs, they need to treat hypertension. First of all, ACI are the first line treatment. First line treatment, even in chronic kidney disease, is ACI. And they especially when the patient has diabetic nephropathy. Okay, it's a very good drug. If you use ACI in a diabetic nephropathy, especially up to the stage of microalbuminuria, they are not only they will control BP, but they will also reduce the progression of nephropathy. One more thing, when we are using ACEI, they reduce the filtration pressure in the kidney. So that reduced filtration pressure itself can lead to fall in GFR and some rise of creatine is expected. I repeat the line again. He says that when you are using ACEI, especially in a kidney patient, it will reduce the filtration pressure. And there will be slight more decrease in GFR and creatinine will rise a little more. Okay. So, that need not worry to you. But if the decrease is too much, the GFR goal card goes on too much, then you look for the other cause. Patient may be taking NSAID. Okay. So, NSAID may be taking that, may be the cause of decrease. So, in that case, you have to take care of the non steroidal anti inflammatory drug also. So, we use frusamide as an anti hypertensive in a patient of CKD, particularly when the GFR is below 45. Okay, 45. And in our case, it is 29. It's a very good drug. And this will help in lowering potassium also. And such cases, normally low dose of frusamide doesn't work. High dose of frusamide are work in these cases. The answer is that give frusamide. Question 50, uh, 5. We are getting a 56-year-old man. Headache, pain, chest, and confusion. BP. Oh, 250, 140. It's very, very high. It is severe hypertension. And we learned in the very beginning the definition of severe hypertension is below one, above 180 and above 110. So he is having both. Blurring of the optic dust disc. This indicates patients also have peplidema. That means patient is in hepatic and cephalopathy. So, or a patient having very high BP with peptidema, what we call as malignant hypertension. So, he is having malignant hypertension. Why? Because of peptidema, I hope you are all aware that with the high BP, peptidema is there, we call as malignant hypertension. And malignant hypertension is a medical emergency. You have to give intravenous agent. There is no role of giving any oral tablet. No role of giving oral tablet. You have to give intravenous. So let's learn how to manage malignant hypertension. Let's learn the basic concept. Severe hypertension, like what our actual definition is, is above 180 by 110. Okay, here he has given example like any patient having maybe 200 by 130 is a severe hypertension. And this can lead to cerebral edema. And this, when the cerebral edema is there, then we call to be encephalopathy. Right? So we are clear about what actually this means. The features, headache, nausea, vomiting, visual disturbance what all these problems are occurring in our patient also, he has come to us, and what there was blurring of vision in our patient. Why? Because of papilledema. Now, even chest pain and dyspnea can occur. This is all due to coronary problem. 
pepidema that indicate encephalopathy okay and seizures all these indicate encephalopathy so friends patient may have uh, problem of the cns cvs eyes all can be there in the case of severe hypertension treatment bed rest and we give intravenous nitroprusside or intravenous labetalol these are the two drug of choice tablet should not tablet should not be given they all should be given intravenous tablet treatment should not be given and one more thing one more thing when we are treating make sure that suppose the diastolic bp is 130 diastolic bp make sure that in the next 12 to 24 hour diastolic bp should not go down below 100 it should not go down below 100. If you go down, the suppose that you bring the diastolic BP to 80, this will severely reduce the cerebral perfusion. Cerebral perfusion will go down and patient will have a lot of difficulty. So never reduce BP, diastolic BP below 100. Question 6, 34 year old men, dyspnea and exercise related syncope father died sudden cardiac death was there at the age of 42 ecg of the patient shows left ventricle hypertrophy now most appropriate next step is so in this patient we are getting a young person syncopal attack which is related to exercise family history of sudden death is there left ventricle hypertrophy all these are indicating the patient has got hocm hocm is hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy okay for this the best investigation is trans thoracic echocardiography so likely diagnosis is hocm and as per nice guidelines when the patient come to you the, your first investigation should be echocardiography transthoracic right so let's really read and learn more about hocm it is a autosomal dominant very frequently asked question very frequently asked there can be a question there is one patient who is dominant okay uh, and uh, this the one is a a okay and other the the partner is a a so what are the chances or the both are like this so they will give a question of genetics what percentage of the children will be having that disease okay but what is, is more important is dominant you know throughout the world whichever exam you write there's always a one question on dominant recessive x link this you have to remember this is dominant and defect in the gene coding contactile protein make the circle of this line the, the autosomal dominant the gene which are controlling the contractile proteins they are defective and is the most common cause of sudden cardiac death in young friends this is the golden line to remember suddenly a young man dies or he has a family history of sudden death of death sudden death if this is given in your question 99.9% .9 you are dealing with HOCM like in this case also father had died suddenly Okay, now this patient has left ventricle hypertrophy. You are dealing with HOCM. So in HOCM, there is a mutation in the gene encoding beta myosin heavy chain protein. Write down. Beta myosin heavy chain protein or myosin binding protein C. Okay. So predominantly diastolic dysfunction point to be noted very carefully 
okay left ventricle hypertrophy will be there and this lead to what decrease compliance and decrease cardiac output now let me show you a diagram this is the heart this the aorta and this the normal interventricular septum now in this patient this septum becomes larger like this there's a asymmetrical hypertrophy so now definitely if the hypertrophy is there this cavity size will be reduced moreover during systole this will come nearer to near to aortic opening as it is coming nearing to uh, aortic opening so this will lead to sub aortic obstruction point to be noted problem is not in the valve it is below the valve we call as subaortic obstruction to the left ventricle outflow lvof stand for left ventricle outflow there is some obstruction is there moreover due to same reason the mitral valves they don't close properly there is systolic anterior motion of the mitral leaflet systolic anterior mo motion of mitral leaflet okay so mitral valves don't close properly with the result there is a murmur of mr also because mitral valves are not getting close and sam is seen on echocardiography so we learned that decrease compliance decrease cardiac output because the compliance is reduced now what happen in the pathology there is myofibril hypertrophy with chaotic and disorganized myocyte classical word they use is disarray suppose the normal myofibril normal myofibril are arranged like this in the wall of the ventricle but now if the if the fiber become they like this what you are finding they are not organized in a proper way so there is disarray disarray well same thing i can give you a better example like you go to a good parking place okay they car they park the car like this so in a small space you can park many cars but quite often you go to market where one car is like this other is like this other like this all chaotic you are not able to take out your car somebody has blocked your car uh, and he has kept his car in front of you so this is hocm this area of the of the myocyte is a classical exam point they will always talk about this area of the myofibril okay most of the time patient has no symptom otherwise exertional dyspnea is the one finding angina syncope angina syncope and dyspnea the pneumonic is ast a angina s syncope and d dyspnea syncope usually follows after exercise typically patient going to play football hockey suddenly he falls on the ground because of syncope okay and i told you the subaortic stenosis is there so that lead to obstruction to left ventricle outflow is reduced and that lead to that lead to syncope attack during exercise lvof left ventricle outflow outflow sudden death this is the classical is the com 
is the classical finding. If you are getting a sudden death, 99% you are dealing with HOCM. Okay. So this uh, sudden death occurred due to ventricular arrhythmias, very common in these patients. And you get, when you auscultate, you get an ejection systolic murmur. But the, but the classical question, uh, the intensity of this murmur increase on well servum and increase on standing. You auscultate the patient lying on the bed, then you ask the patient to stand for two minutes, then you listen, you find the intensity of murmur increase on standing. Maybe you are the patient, even patient lying supine, you ask to do the well salva maneuver, you find the intensity of murmur has increased. This is classically seen in, so this is seen in HOCM and this is also seen in MVP. So there are only two conditions where the intensity of murmur increases on standing and well salva. One is HOCM, other is MVP. Again, a commonly asked question, these HOCM are often associated with Frederick ataxia and WPW syndrome. An eco finding is pneumonic is Mr. Sham Ash. Mr. for mitral regurgitation, the reason I told you. Sam, systolic anterior motion of the mitral leaflet. And asymmetrical septal hypertrophy. So Mr. Sam Ash is the pneumonic MR systolic anterior movement of the mitral leaflet and asymmetrical hypertrophy, classical things. ECG will show you left ventricle hypertrophy. Question 7, we are getting a 19 year old, collapses and dies, playing rugby. This is the classical history of HOCM. Asymmetrical receptor hypertrophy, defect. So, by now, our fundas are very clear that we are getting a sudden cardiac death, asymmetrical septal hypertrophy is a case of what? HOCM and the, the problem lies in the beta myosin heavy chain proteins. These, the, these are defective, that's why there is dysarray. Dysarray of fiber formation. All others, they don't fit into the category of HOCM. The beta myosin heavy chain protein defect is HOCM. Question 8. Similar question. 30-year-old women, dyspnea, jogging, and mother died of heart disease in 30s. EC shows LVH. Okay, so again, almost same question as per previous, sudden cardiac death. Sudden cardiac death and a positive family history. If you are getting this, you are dealing with HOCM and in HOCM, problem is the beta myosin heavy chain. The point I discussed in the previous question also. Question 9, we are getting 23-year-old man's family history of sudden cardiac death. Same story, sudden cardiac death, HOCM possibility, having obstructive myopathy, oh, he has given you the diagnosis also. Strongest marker of poor prognosis is septal wall thickness of more than 3 cm. Well, why the answer? Let's learn the basic. Septal wall thickness more than 3 cm is a poor prognostic feature. All other option, all other option given are, none of them is the, they simply indicate like this is a feature of HOCM. Okay, this is a feature of HOCM. This is a feature of HOCM. This is a feature of HOCM. Okay, feature. But when the septal wall thickness is more than 3 centimeter or 30 millimeter, 30 millimeter, strongest for severe HOCM. Question 10. HOCM patient is there, he complained of palpitation and each 24 hour EC showed non-sustained ventricle tachycardia. Next, the best step is 
implantable cardiovascular defibrillator. He has ventricle tachycardia, non-sustained. But this can go into ventricle fibrillation any moment, any moment, no time. So in such cases, we know VF once a VF is just like having a cardiac arrest. So we want to give implantable cardiovascular defibrillator. In case the patient develop ventricle fibrillation, that he will get DC shock in the body itself. Hence, it is the best answer. None of the other is going to prevent when the patient is having sudden cardiac arrest or ventricle fibrillation. None of the other options are going to take care of his arrhythmia or ventricle fibrillation or cardiac arrest in that particular moment, except is cardioversion. Question 11, we are getting 26 year old, cardiac arrest while playing football, father died suddenly, he has a sudden cardiac arrest and father died, his family is still positive and what a problem, mutation of troponin T, okay, and HOCM and the troponin T is the best answer where the, we have problem of beta chain, okay. So this is the poorest prognostic feature, why? That actually says that whatever you are making a diagnosis of basic pathophysiology is based on the genetic mutation. If this mutation is not there, if this mutation is not there, the problem will not happen. What about wall thickness of 25 millimeter? Most of students go for this answer, but don't forget, wall thickness of more than 30 millimeter 30 millimeter is more suggestive of, of poor prognosis. Symptom of chest pain, symptom of syncope has the worst prognosis. AF on 24 hour monitoring is not a poor prognostic and BP increase, no BP normally decreases on exercise. BP doesn't increase on exercise in HOCM. Hence, the best answer is genetic mutation in toponin 1. Question number 12. We are getting 29 year old MCA in fog stroke and now when he is sleeping lying flat, he become a flu like illness 3 months ago, exertional dyspnea and ejection factor is, is just 15%. 15% injection means he is, is in severe heart failure. Severe heart failure. Most likely cause is parvovirus. Point to be noted that he had a flu-like illness three months ago. So he had a viral myocarditis. And that lead to problem of dilated cardiomyopathy in the last three months. Okay. So, in this case, patient has a viral myocarditis. That's why he had a flu-like feature. And which lead to dilated cardiomyopathy in the next three to four months. And which is causing cardioembolic stroke. But point to be noted, previously as per NICE guidelines, it was enterovirus including Coxsackie virus. They were the most common cause of, of dilated cardiomyopathy or viral myocarditis long back. But now, parvovirus 19, B19 and HHV6 they are the most common cause of viral myocarditis. This is the latest update. Point to be noted, parovirus, HHP6, enterovirus, they all lead to, they all lead to myocarditis which can lead to DCM. But now the latest guidelines are, it is the parovirus or HHV6 virus are the common cause of uh, DCM, of viral myocarditis. And moreover, stroke is cardioembolic, not the 
complicated sinus. Okay, because it's most of time is embolic phenomena. What are the viral causes of? Let me tell you some basic causes. What are the viral causes of myocarditis? Paro, herpes, they are the latest, but they were the previous one. Coxsackie, adeno, and hepatitis C, they are the other viral cause of myocarditis. Most common cause of restrictive cardiomyopathy in UK. Answer is amyloidosis. So, restrictive cardiomyopathy, what are the causes? This can be caused by amyloidosis. It is the most common cause. This can also be caused by hemochromatosis, Loeffler syndrome, and sarcoidosis and scleroderma. Okay? Yeah. So, out of all these, amyloidosis is the most common cause of restrictive cardiomyopathy. In restrictive cardiomyopathy, systole is normal, but problem lies mainly in diastole. So, RCM is like a diastolic dysfunction. Okay. Causes amyloidosis may be due to myeloma, multiple myeloma, otherwise, anyway, whatever way may be, amyloidosis is the most common cause of restrictive cardiomyopathy. Other are hemochromatosis, which is a disease of iron overload stage. Post radiation fibrosis. You are given radiotherapy due to any reason, and this is causing fibrosis of the myocardium. Loeffler syndrome, very, very important question. It is endomyocardial fibrosis with prominent eosinophilic infiltrate in the lung and as well as in the myocardium. Loeffler syndrome. F endocardial fibroelastosis. And here we have got fibroelastic form in the endocardium seen in children. Sarcoidosis and scleroderma are the other causes of, of restrictive cardiomyopathy. So, friend, amyloidosis, hemochromatosis, Loeffler, sarcoidosis, and scleroderma. These are the five important causes you should know, and out of these five, the most common cause is most common cause is amyloidosis. We are getting a f f young man. Question 14. We are getting a young man. Cardiac arrest. Oh, cardiac arrest. I think we are dealing with HOCM. Passes in the hospital. Sudden death. But he had been diagnosed as ethmogenic right ventricle Cardiomyopathy. Oh, we are getting another condition. We are where we can have a sudden cardiac death. What the reason? Myocardium getting replaced by fatty and fibro fatty tissue. So, friends, we are getting second entity. Arrhythmogenic right ventricle hype cardiomyopathy. What is this? It is arrhythmogenic right ventricle cardiomyopathy. Right ventricle myocardium is replaced by the fibrous tissue. Point to be noted that in HOCM, there was hypertrophy of the interventricular septum, which was mainly toward the left ventricle. That's why the left ventricle cavity size was reduced. Here the problem is lying in the right ventricle and normal tissue is getting replaced by the fibrous tissue. So, 
it can lead to syncope or sudden cardiac death it means it is uh, it is again a inherited disorder can lead to syncope or sudden cardiac death just like hocm it is second most common cause of cardiac death death in young people so we got two question where the young patient can die it is dominant even hocm is also dominant and right ventricle is replaced by the fibrous tissue and mutation has in around 50% cases mutation in the desmosome here the problem is in the desmosome and there was problem in the beta chain how does the patient come to you palpitation syncope and sudden cardiac death point to be noted that pain chest is not the important feature of this ecg classically we get epsilon wave this is epsilon this once the qrs complex is finish you get a extra edge or you get a extra edge you are getting more after the qrs is over you are again getting one small spike what is called as epsilon wave so what whenever you are getting uh, epsilon wave it is 99.99% you are dealing with you are dealing with arrhythmogenic right ventricle hyperplasia okay so when you are examining the patient by echocardiography and large hypokinetic right ventricle with thin free wall okay thin the ventricle wall become very thin at on the right side point to be noted very carefully treatment sotalol is the most widely used antiarrhythmic drug in this patient and of course in case of vent patient has persistent ventricular tachycardia we can do cardiac ablation and we also can use uh, implantable cardio uh, water de defibrillator again just like the way we have used in case of hocm also question 15 you are getting 45 year old woman sudden onset of pain chest st segment elevation is there troponin is slightly elevated and angiography shows normal coronary flow so you are getting a normal cardiac flow and you are getting the st segment elevation with troponin t okay and there is no past history there is no past history in this patient but family history is premature coronary artery disease is there her partner passed away her husband or partner they passed away recently and st segment elevation is there what the most likely cause answer is tico subo cardiomyopathy look she is a female around 45 year pain chest ec shows st elevation prangiography shows no luminal obstruction so this this condition is known as tecot subo cardiomyopathy it is also known as broken heart syndrome and this is a type of cardiomyopathy induced by severe stressful or emotional classically in in literature we do talk that his or heart got broken in love it is we have been reading but now we have a disease so called tecot tecot subo cardiomyopathy stressful emotional stress broken heart syndrome 
more in ladies around 40 to 50 years now in this in our case also the patient has a recent loss of his her partner that is a severe emotional stress that support our diagnosis of decot subo cardiomyopathy and classically in this if you do the echocardiography you get apical balloon appearance due to severe hypokinesia of the mid and apical segment with pers with persistence of basal activity so you got a balloon like appearance on echocardiography ballooning apical ballooning is if you are getting apical ballooning with st segment elevation with normal coronary angiography you do angiography the coronary are normal there is no obstruction but you are getting st elevation and echocardiography shows ballooning you are dealing with teco subo cardiomyopathy so this all for today i hope you learned a lot thank you very much god bless all of you